Let's put our hands together for External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar. His unparalleled diplomatic acumen and strategic vision has been instrumental in shaping India's foreign policy in an era of unprecedented change and complexity. Please, let's give him a huge round of applause. And let me also now call upon stage TV9 Network's MD CEO, Barun Das, to kindly felicitate our guest and union minister. Thank you so much, sir. And it's now time to kick start this session. May I please call on stage uh, TV9 Network's Nishant and Aditya Raj Kohl. Please come and key and moderate this very key session here for us this evening. So ladies and gentlemen, the PARPEC session has really begun now. And we have amongst us somebody that you've been waiting to hear uh, for the last two days, External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jai Shankar, certainly needs no introduction over the last many, many decades. He's been a uh, diplomat representing India all across the globe. He's been an envoy, an ambassador uh, to several countries. And of course, in the last few years, representing India the changing dynamic foreign policy of India, the paradigm shift that has been brought in the foreign policy has been led, in fact, by Dr. S. Jai Shankar. A round of applause to welcome the dignitary for his efforts, for his courage of conviction, and the way he has led the entire effort. Thank you very much, sir. The session theme today is Rise of the Global South. And you've been very vociferously speaking about it, particularly in the last two years. We've seen Global South being used repeatedly over the last many decades, 1955 onwards perhaps. But what has changed really? And you know, in my hands uh, is this book that you've just released, Why Bharat Matters. And perhaps you should get this copy very soon. Uh, this was a hot topic discussed recently at the Raisana Dialogue as well. Why Bharat Matters? Why is it important? And has India not only positioned itself but just like Tony Abbott mentioned earlier this morning, that India is leading indeed the Global South. Um, well, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I think the sofa is a bit outsized for me, but, uh, uh, but it's, it's okay. I'll, uh, I'll try and fill the space. Uh, uh, two questions. Uh, one, why the Global South? And secondly, why Bharat matters? Why the Global South? What has been happening in the last few years? Is uh, at one level, you know, the, the world's changing. Uh, uh, the, uh, the more dominant powers are less dominant today. And uh, as part of that change, many countries who would broadly qualify to be in the Global South India is one, Indonesia is one. Uh, you have you know, other, other parts of ASEAN, some of the big countries in Africa, Latin Brazil, Argentina, Mexico. So these countries today count for more, they assert themselves more, uh, and they, they want to share in the, in the conversation. So, so it's like a company, you know, uh, they're more shareholders, but the management uh, needs to recognize that there are more shareholders, so that's one. The second is actually the traumas of the last few years. You know, uh, you had this devastating thing called COVID. You know, uh, many of us have come through it. But as someone who travels very extensively, I've been to places which haven't come through it, you know, where 
the damage you know to uh, to governance the damage to the societal fabric uh, they they've taken such a body blow uh, that they're still kind of reeling from that on top of that the ups and downs of the global economy they saw okay global inflation has gone up uh, uh, debt has gone up uh, uh, trade has been disrupted then you had the ukraine uh, conflict okay and uh, the ukraine conflict had very strong second order effects energy prices food prices fertilizer prices now you're seeing the middle east you know and again the trade disruptions the possibility so what is happening is a lot of these countries feel look we are the we are the people who are really suffering but when there are big global meets it's like they discuss you know we don't count they are discussing a different world out there so this enormous sort of i would say actually use the word anger uh, today in a lot of these countries so when we were uh, preparing uh, for the for the G20 i heard personally and so did the prime minister from many countries who said look you know we expect you you are india you you understand our pain you've been there uh, i mean because you know as as former colonies there's a certain bonding uh, which comes from that so we expect you to to speak up for us now we could have you know just stood there and said okay you know we heard from people but prime minister felt let's actually gather everybody together uh, and uh, hear them out and then kind of distill the essence of that and then put it before the g20 and urge the g20 saying look we speak here when we did our global south summit uh, we had 125 countries there so when we uh spoke to the global uh, to the G20 we were not only speaking on behalf of india la most populous country in the world fifth largest economy but we also had 125 countries who said you know speak for us well uh, one statement speaking of the prime minister narendra modi and you know the kind of leadership that he has shown over the last 10 years uh, and we are of course going into the elections now Uh, is not an era of war he said that at the sco he said that at the g20 and that was reflected in the consensus statement uh, in new delhi as well how i wouldn't ask you how difficult you know these two years have been you know amidst these wars between russia and ukraine and now for the last 5 months between israel and hamas and the position that india has taken the independent position of self interest and the kind of statements that we have heard from europe and the kind of mirror that you have shown to the world how important uh, is this self interest uh, not compromising just like you said at the music uh, at the munich uh, security conference that you know india is being smart about having multiple options well uh, look uh, of course a lot of it is about self interest and i see nothing wrong with self interest you know all of you have self interest you pursue every day but at times it's also bigger than self interest you know uh, say what i was speaking about global south was bigger you know we are, we are not a country which is deeply indebted but we do believe countries who are uh, should should something should be done for them uh, in the case of uh, these issues uh, look uh, you know uh, eventually the stand we took looked very natural you know but you do go through that process of okay something has happened what do we say you know who do we talk to what are the pressures the counter pressures the arguments and then somewhere something gels you know uh, in 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 all of this uh, i think in the in the case of uh, ukraine uh, a lot of it uh, i mean the the uh, we were you know at that time the security council okay so the first i i i was still actually on the flight back from france uh, uh, i had i been meeting macron the previous evening when on the plane i could i i saw the news that the russians had moved in and that security council meeting was actually literally happening when i was on the plane so there was i could only send text messages and and the, uh, i mean at least you could do that from a plane nowadays that that's a help uh, but from what 
initially became like, uh, uh, you know, a political, uh, I would say, a formulation, uh, what is the messaging you are doing. It, once you moved fairly quickly into the uh, sanctioning stage, the, you know, uh, Europe deciding that it was going to take some counteraction, then it actually became a different set of issues arose. And those issues had implications for our national growth, for our development, uh, for, for the average citizen of India. You know. And at that stage, that's when you actually uh, uh, look at your interest, you look at what others are saying, you look at, uh, frankly, how consistent it was. Uh, and part of our problem was that you know, the expectations of us uh, was, I mean, here were countries who are now redirecting. They were reducing the Russia supplies. They were coming into the Middle East. They were essentially coming into markets which, which would have then got impacted because that's where we were buying from, who were graduating out of it, who were managing it for themselves, but were not one giving you that same space, you know. Their expectations of you was more than the demands of themselves. And that, we felt, was deeply unfair and, uh, you know, challenged in a way. Jashankar Ji, your book, Why Bharat Matters, I will quote it in some places, but in one place you have written that the world undoubtedly offers vastly more opportunities, but that is also embedded with new responsibilities. आप एक विजनरी भी हैं मैं आपसे ये जानना चाहूँगा कि वो जिम्मेदारियाँ कौन सी हैं भारत के लिए जिसके लिए हमें तैयार रहना चाहिए। देखिए ऐसा है कि अगर आज हम कहते हैं अब मैं दस साल की बात कर रहा हूँ इस दशक में क्या परिवर्तन आया है? दस साल पहले जब पहली बार नरेंद्र मोदी प्रधानमंत्री बने थे उस समय अगर आप हमारी इकोनॉमिक रैंकिंग देखें हम 11 नंबर थे जैसे मुझे याद है अब आप 11 नंबर इकोनॉमी से 5 नंबर इकोनॉमी बने उसके अलावा आप आपके जो छवि जो है वो इस समय उसमें परिवर्तन आया है आप बड़े मीटिंग में अगर कोई बड़ी आइडिया है तो आपके बहुत सारे आइडियाज होते हैं तो क्या होता कि दुनिया की एक अपेक्षा होती आज जो हमसे जो अपेक्षा है वो पहले की अपेक्षा नहीं थी तो आप आपका प्रश्न है कि ठीक है अपेक्षा तो है तो आप माने कंक्रीट तरीके से आप इसको कैसे दर्शाएंगे मैं कहूँगा मैं आपके दो आपको दो तीन उदाहरण देता हूँ पिछले दस साल में बहुत सारी संकटें आए यमन में सिविल वॉर हुआ नेपाल में भूकंप हुआ श्रीलंका में लैंडस्लाइड्स हुए अब अगर आप देखेंगे एक जमाना था कि कुछ भी दुर्घटना होती थी तो ज़्यादातर पश्चिमी देश जो हैं वो फर्स्ट रेस्पोंडर के रूप में वहाँ पहुँचते थे अब दुनिया बदल गई है वो लोग खुद कम कर रहे हैं वो सोचते हैं कि भाई आप जानते हैं कि वहाँ भी वो बदलावट आया है सब लोग जो हैं एक किस्म से अपने बारे में ज़्यादा सोचने लग गए तो अब ये जिम्मेदारी आप ही बताइए मुझे अगर हमारे इलाके में ऐसी कोई घटना होती है तो किसको आगे आना चाहिए अब ये हमसे ये अपेक्षा और तो ये एक एक मैं आपको उदाहरण दे रहा हूँ दूसरा उदाहरण मैं आपको श्रीलंका का देता हूँ पड़ोस का देश है बहुत सारी चीजें हुई कैसे हुआ क्या हुआ वो अलग बात है पर जिस तरीके से श्रीलंका श्रीलंका की आर्थिक सिचुएशन जो है स्थिति जो है माने आप रोज देख रहे थे कि वहाँ कुछ राइटिंग हो रही थी खाने के लिए कुछ नहीं था पेट्रोल नहीं था तो वहाँ किसी को कुछ कुछ तो करना था अब वो उनकी नेगोशिएशन आईएमएफ से चल रही थी जो पश्चिमी देश उन्होंने ज़्यादा कुछ किया नहीं उनके और भी जो बड़े जिन्होंने कर्ज जिनसे उन्होंने कर्ज लिया था वो लोग भी अपने हाथ पे बैठे रहे अब किसी को तो आगे आना था और हम सबसे बड़े पड़ोसी देश थे तो अगर आप देखें हमने साढ़े चार बिलियन डॉलर का एक पैकेज दिया था जो आईएमएफ के पैकेज से बड़ा था तो एक ये उदाहरण ये भी है कि जहाँ युद्ध जैसे स्थिति होती है जैसे यूक्रेन में हुआ अब हम लोग जो है जो हम सेल्फ इंटरेस्ट की जो बात कर रहे थे मैं मानता हूँ कि हमारे 
उस समय अठारह बीस हजार विद्यार्थी थे पर ये शुरू से हमारी ये एक ये मैं कहूँगा माइंडसेट थी अप्रोच थी कि जब भी हम अपने लिए कुछ कर रहे हैं वहाँ जहाज में बगल बस में कहीं किसी और के लिए आप भला कर सकते हैं उनके लिए अगर दिल में जगह है तो गाड़ी में भी जगह होनी चाहिए और ये अगर आप देखें कितने लोग कितने देशों के लोग हम बाहर लाए वहाँ से भी लाए इसराइल से भी लाए सूडान से भी लाए तो अब जो है दुनिया और सबसे ज़्यादा अगर एक कोई घटना हुई है किसी का अनुभव है जहाँ हमारी छवि बदली है ये वैक्सीन के कारण कि वो देश जो जहाँ वैक्सीनेशन की प्रक्रिया जारी थी हमने खुद अपना ख़त्म नहीं किया था तब भी हमने करीब 100 देशों को वैक्सीन दिया था और कुछ ऐसे देश हैं जो अभी भी खड़े होकर कहते हैं कि अगर आपने नहीं दिया होता हमें कभी वैक्सीन मिलता नहीं तो मैं कहूँगा अगर भारत की एक किस्म से नई पहचान बनी सबसे ज़्यादा ये कोविड और वैक्सीन जो हमने वैक्सीन मैत्री जो हमने चलाई थी इसका सबसे ज़्यादा प्रभाव हुआ लेकिन अब, अब आपकी किताब का ही मैं यहाँ पर एक कोट करूँगा आपने कहा इंडिया हैज़ नाउ इवॉल्व इन टू एन इफेक्टिव फर्स्ट रिस्पॉन्डर इन रीजनल क्राइसिस सिचुएशन इंडिया मैटर्स बिकॉज इट कैन मेक अ रियल डिफरेंस टू ग्लोबल नीड्स हम तो फर्स्ट रिस्पॉन्डर हैं और ये हम अपनी जिम्मेदारी बखूबी निभा रहे हैं जो कि आप लोगों का जो कर्तव्य है वो दिख रहा है सब लेकिन ऐसे में मालदीव जैसे मुल्क भी आते हैं जहाँ पर हम हमेशा उनकी फर्स्ट चॉइस ऑफ हेल्प रहे हैं और वो बाद में अंदर ही अंदर वहाँ पर देखते हैं कि सत्ता में भारत के खिलाफ आवाज़ें बुलंद करना शुरू कर देते हैं इसको लेकर भारत की नीति और सोच क्या है देखिए मानवता भी मानवता होती है कूटनीति भी कूटनीति होती है और राजनीति भी राजनीति होती है तो क्या होता है कि पूरी दुनिया जो है हर समय कृतज्ञता और एहसान पे नहीं चलती ये है अब क्या करें सच है तो मैं कहूँगा इस समय जब आपको लगता है कि आ, कहीं हम ऐसी नौबत पे आ गए हैं अब ये इसका रास्ता जो हो कूटनीति ही निकालेगा और मुझे लगता है कि अगर हम कोई भी सिचुएशन में हमें माने समझाना चाहिए लोगों को एक किस्म से हो सकता है कि उनको पूरी चीज़ पता भी नहीं है कभी कभी लोग जो हैं गुमराह हो जाते हैं कोई कुछ कह देता है अब मैं आपने मॉलडिव्स की बात की अब मॉलडिव्स में हमारे दो हेलीकॉप्टर हैं और एक प्लेन है और वो क्यों है वो हैं ज़्यादातर उनका उपयोग होता है वो मेडिकल मेडवैक जो कहते हैं मेडिकल इवैक्यूएशन में होता है इसका लाभ किसको मिलता है मालडिव्स के पब्लिक को मिलता है अब ये हैं मिलिट्री के प्लेन अगर मिलिट्री के प्लेन मिलिट्री वाले नहीं चलाएंगे तो कौन चलाएगा वही चलाएंगे वो तो स्वाभाविक अब अगर उनको इस पर कोई इतराज़ है तो हमने कहा ठीक है बैठ जाइए हम इसका सुझाव निकालते हैं और हम निका, हम निकालेंगे ज़रूर तो ये कभी कभी हो जाता है जैसे मैंने कहा कि जो भी आप कहें जितने मैंने हम हमारी नीयत साफ हो नीति स्पष्ट हो तब भी कभी कभी ये हम ऐसे सिचुएशन में आ जाते कि हमें इसका कहीं ना कहीं सुझाव निकालना पड़ता है और मुझे मुझे विश्वास है कि हम इसको हम माने इसका सलूशन हम निकाल पाएंगे वी हैव जस्ट अ फ्यू मोर क्विक क्वेश्चन मिनिस्टर जयशंकर यू नो दिस मॉर्निंग वी हैड प्राइम मिनिस्टर टोनी अबाउट स्पीकिंग Uh, as the global keynote here at the TV9 Global Summit, and he emphasized, and he has been famously quoted in saying that India is an upcoming democratic superpower. He's also famously said last year that India, uh, he would like to see India as uh, the 21st century as the India century, and it's better than having the Chinese century. So the question to you, sir, is how does one deal with China? How have you been dealing with China over the years? because he said if you have to tackle china a bully then you have to stand up to the bully we face china in different capacities uh, we've also you know given an olive branch we've had the chennai connect the wuhan spirit but is that the thing of the past post 2019 2020 is there a new uh, policy towards china and what's the road ahead 
Um, you know, uh, it's interesting, we've had ups and downs, but at one level, there is actually a consistency. And the consistency is this. Uh, if you were to, you know, uh, list three or four really big things which have changed in the last 20, 25 years, I think most people would agree it would be the rise of China and the rise of India. Okay. You can say, okay, China started it much earlier because, you know, our, our own politics here delayed the era of reform. I mean, we, that's okay. I mean, what's done is done. Now, but there's no question both countries are rising. And for, the, for world politics, this poses a very interesting problem. The problem is this. The, both are changing the world order by their rise. So each one has an impact vis-a-vis -vis the world. But they also happen to be neighbors. So their relationship is also changing while it's changing vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Okay? It makes it, therefore, very complicated to, to create an equilibrium, you know. Right. How do, you know, so it's like, this is dynamic, that is dynamic, how do they maintain stability while both are moving vis-a-vis -vis the world order? And we tried initially to, because, you know, there were understandings in the 1990s, to manage the uh, line of actual control, the border areas, and to build the rest of the relationship. We tried to maintain that equilibrium uh, naturally first through diplomacy. So what you saw at Wuhan and Mamalapuram, etc., was that equilibrium maintenance uh, exercise. You know, uh, to, I, as I wasn't at Wuhan, I was in Mamalapuram, and there was very frank talking, you know, uh, between the leaders. But what happened in 2020 was China, for whatever reason, chose to move military forces in, you know, in disregard of agreements. Now, that called for a different response for the equilibrium. So the only, the, natural, the logical thing for us to do, which is what we did, was we moved up forces in a very big way. So from 2020, you have an equilibrium, uh, one part of which is the military posture on the border, in the border areas. One part of it is today, obviously, a, a, a political rela relationship impacted by this uh, border uh, situation. One part of it is also the, the economic measures we have taken. Because, you know, if there is a country today which is trying to put me under pressure, I should take, rightfully take economic precautions vis-a-vis uh, -vis this country. And in any case, you know, uh, we believe, this government believes that the interests uh, of our uh, working class, the interests of our small enterprises, the interests of our industries must be protected against unfair competition. Uh, so there are also measures which, which uh, tie, in, tie in against that. So our effort today is, you know, we have to build the deep strengths. You know, we have to create our digital capabilities, our telecom, you know, our manufacturing, uh, uh, our pharma industry, our health self-sufficiency, our defense industry, our ability to deploy on the border, which you can only do if you build the infrastructure. So in the past, you know, till, frankly, till 2014, you know, our average expenditure uh, on the uh, China border was about 3,500 crores. Today, it is almost 15,000 crores. So, there was a neglect of the border infrastructure. You can't defend your border if you don't build the infrastructure there. One of the problem areas, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, in the past few years has been the Khalistani separatism and terrorism that has emanated uh, probably from Canada, but also to an extent from UK, from US, and from Australia. You've been dealing with that. Uh, but in particular, post the G20, uh, the India-Canada ties have suffered. Uh, perhaps there is some backroom dialogue that is underway. We had stopped visas. Uh, well, I see that smile there. Uh, I don't know how much you can say. But I, people want to know, and perhaps in the audience as well, there are quite a few who have suffered because they are not getting visas on time, and there are delays uh, that are happening on the Canadian side. But when will this provocation really end, particularly from Canada? And do you think there is growing understanding 
at least from the Canadian politicians, or is this just political compulsion for them to just let this Khalistani separatism be, uh, because it is becoming snakes in their backyard movement, just like Pakistan for Canada? Uh, well, look, first of all, let me say this with, regarding visas, okay? Uh, we had to suspend the issue of visas in Canada because our diplomats were not safe going to work. Our diplomats were repeatedly threatened. Uh, they were intimidated in many ways, and we got very little comfort from the Canadian system at that time. It has improved uh, since then. So uh, we reached a stage where, as a minister, I could not risk you know, exposing my diplomats uh, to the kind of violence which was very clearly prevalent in Canada at that time. So that's, but that part of it has been rectified. So today, our visa operations are pretty much uh, normal. Hmm? Now, regarding uh, the, uh, you know, the space which has been given to uh, Khalistanis, to extremists of various kinds. Look, uh, you, they keep telling us, you know, we are a democracy, there's freedom of speech, and therefore people, you know, say these things. Now, Freedom of speech cannot extend to intimidating uh, diplomats who are doing their duty, throwing smoke bombs into embassies and consulates, it actually uh, advocating violence and separatism against a friendly state. I mean, I mean, to me, this is not freedom of speech, this is misuse of freedom of speech. Now, uh, we've had this to different degrees in different countries. I mean, in the UK, uh, we saw actually a high commission uh, being, uh, you know, uh, attacked by mobs. Uh, and honestly, we didn't get the kind of protection which we sh expected to get. And to a point of someone actually physically climbing into our high commission and bringing down the Indian flag. Now, I asked my colleagues, let's put ourselves in each other's shoes. How would you react? if a mob came and did something to one of your diplomatic premises somewhere in the world. You know, you wouldn't say, oh, there's freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and freedom of expression. You'd be jumping up and down. So the, the whole point now, again, things have improved in UK. So the, the point is, you know, uh, we find today that in many countries, uh, uh, we, we've had a much firmer response in Australia and in the US. Okay. We had an arson attack in US, but that is under investigation. And we expect that the US, you know, if, look, if a receiving state does not investigate and take action against someone who uh, attacks an embassy or a consulate, there is a message in it. Now, I don't, I don't think it's good for any of these countries to send that kind of message for their own repetition. So we expect the culprits in, in the attack in our consulate in San Francisco to be brought to book. We expect action against people who stormed into a high commission in London. We expect people who, you know, who threaten our diplomats, who put up posters. I mean, they put up posters of our diplomats with urging people to be violent against them. Now, just imagine if, if roles were reversed. Shankarji. आपको सुनने के बाद अब हमें समझ में आ रहा है कि भारत की जो एक 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 एसर्टिवनेस है उसके पीछे का राज क्या है आपका और प्रधानमंत्री मोदी का बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया जिस तरीके से विदेश के मंच पर भारत की अभी एक प्रतिष्ठा बनती जा रही है और हम आगे बढ़ते जा रहे हैं और आप सभी लोगों से मैं पुनः बोलूंगा वो किताब जरूर पढ़ें वाई भारत मैटर्स बिकॉज इट इट एक्चुअली मेक्स अ बिग डिफरेंस इन अंडरस्टैंडिंग आगे क्या हो रहा है और अभी क्या है बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया हमारे साथ जुड़ने के लिए आपका बहुत आभार जोरदार तालियों से Many thanks. Many thanks to Honorable Jashin.